hi, I'm Tommy. Um, and just a bit of preamble. I'm a third year physics student from the University of Salford, so my rigor won't be amazing with this. Um, and this will be going over the stuff that I've done with my off my third year project. Um, I'll be fairly mindful of the time as well, because in my abstract, I said I would cover pretty much everything I did and then realized that is quite a lot. Uh, so I may go a bit quick and run over slightly into my questions. So I apologize in advance. So just a quick breakdown of the contents then for what this will cover. Um, the first part's purely going to be to do with the Ablett static equation. We're going to talk about its origin, its components, and we're going to compare it to the discrete nonlinear Schrodinger equation, another commonly used equation within optics and this kind of stuff. And then we're going to look at the Ablett static's long wavelength limit and then some 1D analysis, looking at different kinds of um, trial solutions. Then we're going to try and or focus on implementing a discrete ring cavity system into the Ablett static equation, which will be done via mean field theory, and then look at the um, and some analysis with this in one and two um, spatial dimensions, followed by some very, very brief conclusions about the entire project because time is of the essence. Um, so just to start off, um, nonlinear equations are quite commonly used in optics and have been for quite a long time. And as mentioned before, um, the discrete nonlinear Schrodinger equation is um, used a fair bit and it's favored amongst physicists for example because it's such a physical equation each term in it can be attributed to something that's real um, so just quickly breaking down the discrete nonlinear Schrodinger equation because all of this will map directly onto the Ablett lattic so first we're going to talk about this little subscript here n and this denotes the channel that the wave is traveling in a waveguide array which here will be described as an infinitely wide series of parallel channels and these channels have a spacing of D. And from that, we construct the transverse spatial coordinate. The next term um, contains a constant C, and this controls the strength of the nearest neighbor linear coupling. So the greater the value of C, the more overlap will be seen between um, adjacent channels. And the last term here contains, well, it's a nonlinear term, and it contains a constant chi that is proportional to the third order susceptibility, which is why that's in quotation marks, because it isn't actually susceptibility is missing a few constants. And this um, susceptibility is typically seen in photonics and uh, Maxwell equations with uh, polarization and electric displacement, I think. Um, and the point at which chi equals zero defines two separate regimes, the self-focusing, which is what we're gonna focus on here, and also the self-defocusing. And these are analogous to con con convex and concave lenses. Um, the problem with the DNLS, however, when it comes to modeling is that it isn't integrable. Um, and why that's problematic is because you can't get exact solutions for certain things. Um, so the solution to this was introduced in 1976 by two, two people called Ablevitz and Laddick, and they formed a set of equations called the Ablevitz static equations. And here is one of them, and this is the integral counterpart to the NLS. So it can have exact solutions, which makes it much more favorable to modeling. The discrepancy between these two equations lie in the nonlinear term. So as can be seen here, the Ablett static has got non-local cubic nonlinearity compared to the DNLS's local. Um, and also as well, the chi term in the Ablett static isn't quite as clearly physically um, cut as in the DNLS. So the trade-off for this integrability is a lack of physical interpretation or a much more complex one. And and as in a lot of this um, nonlinear PDE stuff, um, it's important to consider how it behaves in a continuum or a long wavelength limit. So that's what we're going to do here. So we introduce a characteristic, 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 characteristic length scale, uh, lambda x, that is slowly varying in the transverse spatial coordinate xn. And it's large compared to the uh, channel spacing d. And this makes a set of the amplitudes a continuous property, as seen here, moving the subscript into the argument. And considering how this changes amplitudes adjacent to channel n, we can do a Taylor expansion about channel n, only taking the lowest order terms of d, because uh, d is very small, it's very physics-y. Um, you neatly get the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, um, which is unsurprisingly the same long wavelength limit as for the DNLS. And now what we can start to do is look at some um, trial solutions for this. So take a very general uh, plane wave solution, one that's given here, and substituting that into the Ablett static, we can form a term for the propagation constant. Um, and this agrees in the long wavelength limit, provided that the intensity times by its frequency product always vanishes. And this is something that we're going to continuously do throughout, because consistency um, from the discrete case to the uh, continuum cases, well, it's important. It, it shows that things work and the maths works and so on. And again, now we can take a more complicated plane wave solution. And this time it's uh, only considering the on-axis. And this time it's gonna have some perturbation or background noise called, uh, which we're just gonna call AN, and it's a function of Z. 
And from that, we're going to form a linearized equation in ANZ where we're looking, where the equation as Fourier mode solutions is given with the complex um, exponential solutions for eta and mu that are dependent on Z. And then from that, we're going to form a two by two matrix problem by substituting it all of it, all of it into the linearized equation where the matrix M is given as follows. And this can be solved to give the dispersion relation for the background noise. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to take the imaginary component of the dispersion relation and we're going to plot that. And whenever we see, um, whenever we see um, the imaginary component not equal to zero, we actually find that instabilities occur. And what this has given us here is the analytical modulation instability spectrum. And as, just, as I said, we, we see instabilities when this imaginary component isn't equal to zero. It's got this bow tie structure that is two pi periodic in KXD and hence has an infinite number of degenerate peaks. And the values that of KXD, so here and here, that coincide with these peaks are given as the most unstable spatial frequency. And what we're going to do here is we're going to take these most unstable spatial frequencies and construct, and construct the spatial domain via the relationship of wavelength and spatial frequency um, as done here. So this is a spatial domain made of eight most unstable spatial wavelengths. And the plane wave has got eight peaks, which is, again, a nice, nice and consistent thing amongst itself. And again here, if we take the Fourier transform of it and cut out the middle peak, because it's not a point of interest here, um, we see that two smaller peaks emerge um, based around the most unstable spatial frequency, which is com which shows that the numerics are completely consistent with the uh, analytical um, MI spectrum, which is great. Um, so then what we can do as well is we can plot this MI spectrum while varying chi mod A squared um, as well as KXD. And the reason we vary chi mod A squared is a coupled thing is because everywhere it appears in the dispersion relation, so here and here, they're, they're, they're coupled together. So it's perfectly fine to do this. Um, and in the positive region or the self-focusing regime, we see this bow tie structure again. But if you look in the, the self-focusing, so the back here, we get this really broad band structure. And in this self-defocusing regime, for, for, for at least the DNLS, you would you would not get this. It will be completely flat. But for the Abelvitz Latic, you do get this broadband structure. And this is actually um, the same criteria in which solid, or dark soliton solutions exist, which is something that isn't seen with the DNLS. And moving on to this idea of soliton solutions very briefly now, what is a soliton? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a wave that's essentially invariant in space and time, provided that there's no external interference applied to it. And soliton solutions are thought to exist or are expected to exist for the Abelvitz Latic due to it being integrable, which is why they don't exist for the DNLS. And as can be seen here, if we look at the amplitude, transverse velocity, and propagation constant, that these all agree in the long wavelength limit, provided that the soliton width is much larger than channel spacing d. And again, we can plot some very straightforward plane waves, both on and off axis. And you can see it's pretty much invariant in space. Well, it is invariant in space and time. Um, just goes about, goes about it today. Um, so then moving on to a discrete ring cavity very briefly. So what's happening here is a pump wave is being fed into a series of mirrors, and this forms a closed path through a nonlinear medium for the wave to traverse. And as the wave traverses this path, it will start to perturb and diffract and superimpose with the newly inputted wave when it returns back to the coupling mirror. And this produces the patterns that are going to be modeled here. So we're going to look at the um, we're going we're going to look to implement this into the Abelvitz static equation. And the way this is going to be done is via mean field theory. And in a very crude way of saying, this is essentially just hardwiring the system parameters directly into the equation. So as can be seen here, all right hand terms of here are just due to cavity effects. And this is pretty much unchanged besides the derivative is now with respect to t because mean field describes how an average field behaves in time, essentially. Well, very crudely. Um, and these effects or these cavity effects can be described as follows. So if you expand out that um, small bracket there, you've got the first time will be due to radiative losses due to the wave traversing the coupling mirror. The second one will be due to the mismatch of phase of the newly inputted wave with the wave that's already in the cavity. And the last term is just the linear contribution to the pump wave, which is constantly being added to the system. We're going to look for uniform um, solutions of this. Um, so um, what we're going to look for ones is that are completely invariant in space and time. So what that means is this term, when it subs in, goes to zero. So does this one. And this term reduces as follows. And if we take those three terms and put it all into the Abelvitz Latic, we form this equation, which allows us to form two separate equations, one for the amplitude of the wave and one for the intensity. And just as before for modulation instability, you can form a linearized equation by considering some perturbed plane wave using this uniform state of the cavity. And this time it's with respect to time instead of uh, Z due to mean field. And again, these have got the exact same Fourier mode solutions and exact same complex exponential solutions for the eta and mu, but again, with respect to time. So 
again, following the same steps, form a two by two matrix problem where the matrix is a bit more complicated this time with a few discrepancies here, such as the gamma term being included now as well. And because we're considering the uniform states of the cavity, when we're solving this, we need to make sure that the complex frequency of the perturbation is equal to zero. So the wave is neither growing or decaying in time, nor is it oscillating. And this is gonna give us static patterns. So when omega equals zero, the wave is not growing or decaying in time, hence the lambda is equal to zero. And um, we're going to assign a certain intensity that coincides with this. We plug this intensity into the determinant, and then we can plot something called the threshold instability. And we're going to look at the feature that's closest to zero, so about here. Um, and what we're going to do is, just as before, is we're going to extract the minimum threshold intensity, construct the spatial domain. And then what we do is we take a value slightly above this intensity, um, and then we plug that into the plane wave. And then we plot that plane wave over the spatial domain we've constructed. And as you can see, spontaneously, these static patterns emerge in time, that very long amount of time as well. It's 500 units of time that it's pretty much invariant, well, 400-ish. Um, and um, we, we get these patterns forming. And these patterns are known as Turing patterns um, because they're completely completely stable. And these were form or hypothesized in 1952 or something uh, by Alan Turing. Um, and the reason we don't consider too high above this um, minimum threshold intensity is because it typically invalidates the linear analysis. So as seen here, um, this is still a Turing pattern because it is pretty much uniform and stable throughout time, but except there's now a ninth peak emerging. And lastly as well, we can just see that this agrees in the long wavelength limit. Um, and this is actually a result derived for a driven care cavity based on a Lanier Schrodinger equation by Louis Giato and Lefebvre. And that's again, a lovely consistency amongst uh, people in maths, I suppose. So now um, scale it up to 2D. Um, what we wanna do is include a second spatial coordinate um, and we're going to call this YM, and it's going to behave exactly the same as it would do, uh, as the XM one does. So it's pretty much identical. Um, and what was being looked for here was a series, or was a bunch of square and hexagonal patterns to crystallize after a short amount of time. And these examples here are given for a discrete nonlinear Schrodinger ring cavity, which is non-mean field, um, taken from a talk given a few weeks back. What actually happened, however, was um, a threshold, um, a, a, a discrete grid was made from the 1D threshold spectrum shown before, and the simulations were run. Um, and patterns start to form in some areas. So for example, you can see it's starting to crystallize at like certain uh, points here where it's quite uh, yellow. But within about 30 units of time, it blew up and just completely became unstable uh, within about, I think it was literally 30 units of time. Yeah, and it goes up by an entire order of magnitude, which is um, unfortunate. So because it was growing so rapidly, um, a remedy for it was maybe trying to include, um, well, it was trying to transform the equation to cancel the pump wave due to its additive contribution. It may be causing the, grave, the wave to grow or the system to grow preferentially and just blow up. However, sadly, neither of these things worked and we were still left with unstable patterns. Um, so just as some very, very, very sweeping conclusions, um, the one diavolit static mean field works wonderfully, literally numerically, there was no problems. You just wrote the code, pressed it, and it ran perfectly. Um, for the 2D case, however, it just did not want to cooperate. It was awful um, and, and like very difficult to get any sort of pattern to crystallize, no matter what, what transforms or anything was tried to remedy it. However, you could see that patterns were trying to form. So there might be some indication that initial conditions, if they're chosen correctly, could actually give a stable system and then patterns could crystallize and hopefully you could get maybe squares or hexagons out of it. Um, but that's yet to be found yet. Anyway, I've rambled on a bit too much over my time. So thank you for listening to my uh, talk. Uh, yeah, cool. Thanks a lot, Tommy. Yeah. I don't see any questions in the chat so far. So perhaps I can ask one. Yeah, we sure. don't have much time. So yeah, um, do you have any sense about what sort of initial conditions are going to do the trick? Like, uh, for example, generate this sort of... Um, oh, um... What, what do you mean? Like, uh, how, how, what, what could possibly remedy it, you mean? Yeah, sure. Make it work? Um, well, um, stuff that had been tried, which I hadn't mentioned, um, just due to time and stuff, um, in, instead of actually trying to change the equation, change the, um, where is it? Just just change the uh, perturbation, um, AN. Um, so so it, it, the, the noise is generated randomly between fixed limits, so it's not okay. like... To um to to rapidly changing, um and what one thing that I did was I just massively reduced these limits down like really really small, okay. and I did end up starting to get square patterns starting to crystallize, 
Um, but because the limits were so small, it barely constituted a pattern because it was like 10 to the minus five. Um, and that seemed to sort of stabilize it a bit, but even still, eventually it just completely collapsed to uh, like complete instability. Um, and to be honest, um, the person that I was doing this with, my supervisor, kind of forewarned uh, me about this and said that these are built off something called ginsberg landau equations, which are just horribly unstable numerically, apparently. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that this was sort of expected. And the fact that even the 1D case worked was a surprise in itself, to be honest. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> Thanks a lot. That's very interesting. Yeah. My background is PDE, so this is uh, always uh, interesting for me to hear. So thanks a lot, Tommy. <laughs> yeah, no, um, yeah, thank you for having me.